This week, a lecture about Theodore Roosevelt's life and political career, including his rise in New York politics, his presidency, and his international explorations post-presidency. Washington was a Republican. Washington spoke for a segment of the black population in the United States, and Roosevelt valued him as a political consultant. But when word leaked out that the president had sat down as an equal, basically, to dinner with a black man in the White House, the white South exploded in rage. Coming up, more with Taylor University professor Benjamin Wetzel. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Um, We've been looking at aspects of Gilded Age and Progressive Era American life for the last couple weeks. We've looked at the West. We've looked at the Jim Crow South. We've looked at capital and labor and progressive reforms. Today, we're looking at how the life of one crucially important figure from this period helps to flesh out in kind of concrete life some of those abstract ideas that we've been looking at. So today, we're looking at the life and career of Theodore Roosevelt, Not uh, the last time that we'll come back to him in this class, but a day kind of just specifically geared toward him. His life does fit the themes of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era very well, and it's also um, part of my area of research. So Taylor is primarily a teaching institution, but all of your faculty are doing research on their own as time permits. And for me, I finished writing a book last year on the religious life of Theodore Roosevelt. So this is a time for me to get to actually talk about some things I've done some specialized research on. So that's just some of the background to what we're looking at here. Again, start with, uh, stop with questions along the way as appropriate. Let me ask you one to start with, which is simply, I want to know any kind of background information you might know about Theodore Roosevelt. He's not you know, Rutherford B. Hayes that maybe you never heard of before. I think you at least have heard of Theodore Roosevelt. So one or two pieces of information that kind of get our minds going on that direction. Yeah, Delaney. Is he like the man with like the weird haircut? <laughs> uh, the pants nay eyeglasses, yes. They look weird to us. It wouldn't have looked weird to his friends, but yes. Okay, pants nay eyeglasses. Yeah, Andy. Um, I know a lot about his like, conservation Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that. So, um, someone who really believed in conserving America's wildlife and beauty also hunted a lot. Is there a contradiction there? We can we can talk about that. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, Kate. He, he was uh, president uh, during the starting of the Industrial Revolution. Kind of starting to kick off. Oh yeah, the same time we've been talking about with the Carnegies and Rockefellers. The first decade of the 20th century is the time of TR's presidency. Yeah, great. Okay, so. We know a little bit about him. He is not his fifth cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, in the New Deal in World War II. That'll come in a few weeks. This is the first and the greater, maybe, Roosevelt. So we'll talk about him. A little bit of background here on where and when was he born, his bringing up years. And Roosevelt's born October of 1858 in New York City. He's that kind of symbolically anyway, the kind of heart and center of American life, born into a very wealthy family. We'll talk about that in a little bit. He is very much a child of the Civil War, who was only, um, you know, five years old, kind of when a lot of this was happening, but it impacted him greatly. I'll come back to this slide in a second. Here are two photographs. This is a photograph of President Lincoln's funeral procession in the spring of 1865. After he'd been assassinated, his body came back from Washington, D.C. to Springfield, Illinois, where he was going to be buried. And as part of that procession for Americans to pay their last respects to him, came down Broadway in New York City. And here's a photograph of the procession. And you can see right here, there's some people looking out of windows. If we zoom in over here, you can see these two little boys looking out the window. <clears throat> we know that this was Theodore Roosevelt's grandfather's house, And that this is T.R. and his uh, little brother, Elliot, who actually had kind of a front row seat to Lincoln's funeral procession. Lincoln would be a hero and a model for T.R. during his own presidency. It's very interesting that, again, he's kind of a front row witness to some of these events of the Civil War era. Even though he would eventually become known as kind of a a man's man, an advocate of the strenuous life, um, that was not always the case. He grew up... Um, weakened by various ailments as a young boy. Asthma was probably the greatest plague that he suffered from, and he had asthma really badly. I won't ask for a show of hands if anyone in here has asthma, if you know someone who does, but it was a very uh, difficult time for him as a young boy. 
He also had poor eyesight. And when he got his first pair of glasses, as maybe some of you can relate to, it really changed his whole world of what was possible. The way he over, strived to overcome some of these physical problems was through workouts, through bodybuilding, weightlifting, wrestling, things of that nature. And even though, probably in hindsight, it really didn't do a lot for him, he thought that it did. And he began to believe that the way to overcome hardship in life, the way to overcome difficulties, was to work harder, to advocate for that strenuous life, to build yourself up. And again, psychologically, I think it had a lot of impact on him. He's also a lover of the outdoors, and Andy alluded to this in your comment about conservation. He was a great bird lover. As a young boy, this was his, one of his, ha- his hobbies and passions was ornithology. Looking for birds, writing down the kind of birds that he saw, keeping track of that, as well as rowing and hunting and pretty much anything you could do outdoors. That's a little bit of what he was like as a young boy, as a teenager. <clears throat> when he was 18, he went off to Harvard, where he studied for... Four years, this is before there were majors and things like that. He just took classes that he wanted to, basically. Um, Took a lot in history, took a lot in natural philosophy um, and in in science. And he married um, a local girl from Boston, Alice Lee. We'll have more to say about her in a second. So it's a little bit of the background to who he would become later on as an adult. Then take a few minutes to explain how Roosevelt came to prominence before he became president. His first kind of career was as a New York assemblyman. So think of the state House of Representatives. That's what we're talking about for New York. We've been reading the novel In His Steps, written in 1896, and trying to understand the world of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era through it. Remember the characters of Pastor Henry Maxwell and of the president of Lincoln College in that novel and how they were very averse to politics, how they thought of politics as low and dirty and it was a great struggle for them to get involved. That's the kind of attitude the Roosevelt's family has about politics in the early 1880s. He comes from a wealthy, upper-crust, elite family who sees politics as run by saloon keepers, as run by immigrants who they're kind of prejudiced against, as run by New York Democrats who they're definitely against. Roosevelt bucked the trend in his family by deciding, like Maxwell or like President Marsh of Lincoln College in the novel, to plunge into politics. And he got himself elected in 1881 from what they called the Silk Stocking District of New York, the kind of the wealthiest of the wealthy in Manhattan. And he served as an assemblyman for several years. He knew Samuel Gompers, the AFL leader. We read a document from Samuel Gompers a few weeks ago, and he began at this stage to get involved with some of those kinds of progressive reforms. So he's an assemblyman for several years, but in February of 1884, Roosevelt experienced a tragedy that would come to mark the rest of his life. So picture this. His wife, Alice, is pregnant, and in New York City, he's living in Albany in the state capitol during the weekdays, doing his legislative stuff and coming home on weekends. February 1884, um, Roosevelt got a telegram that his wife had given birth. And it's all very exciting. He gets congratulations. Then he gets a second telegram urging him to come home right away that there's something seriously wrong. He boards the train in Albany. It's a kind of dark, foggy night. It takes him five hours to get back to New York City by train from Albany. And when he gets home, um, his brother Elliot has remarked, there's a curse on this house. Mother is dying and Alice is dying too. February 14th, 1884, his mother died of uh, typhoid fever, and then a few hours apart, his wife, pictured here, Alice Roosevelt, passed away from Bright's disease that was probably just not detected during her presidency. So the two deaths weren't related. There wasn't a plague or whatever. But they both passed away within a few hours of each other. At this point in his life, Roosevelt wasn't writing as consistently in his diary as he had as a younger man, but he took up his pen to record the document you see here. A big black X, and then that one kind of haunting sentence, the light has gone out of my life. And 
He's 25 when this happens, okay? So you just have to use your imagination, your historical empathy to think about what it would be like at 25 years old to be a brand new father, as Alice had given birth to a daughter, also named Alice, but then to lose your wife and your mother in the same house on the the same day. This is a defining tragedy for Roosevelt and one he had to cope with in the immediate aftermath. His way of dealing with this was to go out west. Pause there for questions before I get get into anything else. So several years before, Roosevelt had purchased two ranches in the Dakota Territory, not yet a state of North and South Dakota, it's just the Dakota Territory. He had purchased two ranches there, and uh, in the aftermath of this tragedy, he decides he's going to go out west, and he's going to start ranching. He did not think of himself as a cowboy. Cowboys worked for him. He was the boss. He owned the land. He was the rancher. But that didn't prevent him from purchasing this kind of outfit, from being photographed, okay, and some of the stuff is like Tiffany knives and so forth. I mean, he gets the best of the best for this, okay? And he goes and becomes a rancher. He never lives in the Dakota Territory full-time. He commutes back and forth, as it were, between New York and the Dakotas for several years. But during this time, he becomes acquainted with a different type of American, more of that hard-bitten, blue-collar type of American, the people who were settling in the West and dispossessing Native Americans, as we talked about um, in the second week of the class. But it sheds some of his elitism for him. He comes to realize that there are a lot of people who didn't grow up in the kind of wealthy atmosphere that he did, and that he really likes spending time with these blue-collar cowboy types. As a historian, he also takes an interest in the conquering and settlement of Um, Western territories. For him, this is more like Kentucky and Indiana, the things that were the West, you know, in the early days of the Republic. Um, But he has kind of now a personal connection with this. So off and on until 1887, he's living in the West. At that time, he remarries. His his second wife, Edith, um, they would have a very happy marriage uh, lasting until Roosevelt's death in 1919. But the West shaped him. Here the romance of my life began, he would recall um, later on when he is visiting in that area. So some connections of things we talked about with the West. Then he gets appointed to a political position by President Benjamin Harrison, Indiana's own, in 1889 as civil service commissioner. The civil service is another one of these progressive reforms that's happening in this time. Before the civil service commission... Um, people were appointed to bureaucratic positions just basically by being friends with the president. Okay? So an example I would use here in Upland, Indiana, if I was elected mayor of Upland, I could appoint my friends to positions like um, street cleaning commissioner. So Isaac or you know, somebody has campaigned for me, he's knocked on doors, I'd be very glad to make him street cleaning commissioner whether or not he knows anything about it. Okay, as kind of a reward. And Caden contributed to my campaign, so he will be deputy postmaster. Okay, that was the old patronage system. By the 1880s, people were concerned that this was not actually putting the best people <laughs> in bureaucratic positions, and that maybe there should be some kind of merit test, a civil service exam. You had to pass before you could be appointed to one of these positions. We still have these civil service exams today. This is part of the legacy of the progressive era. So Roosevelt as part of the civil service um, commissioner office, was charged with making sure that the right people or people who qualified, passed exams, were appointed to these kinds of positions and not just the friends of those who happened to be elected. It's not the most exciting time in his life, so we'll pass over it rather quickly, but this is what he was doing for these six years in the late 80s and early 1890s. Then, in 1895... um, he was kind of called back to New York City and appointed as, the, as a police commissioner for the NYPD. Now, this despite the fact that he had no experience in the police department. It may be a little bit ironic, right, for a civil service commissioner <laughs> to be appointed as something he didn't really have all that many qualifications for. But he went on to serve for several years as one of four police commissioners in New York. Some of you perhaps have seen the TV show Blue Bloods. Okay, I see a few recognition. Maybe you watch it or your parents watch it. 
Um, Tom Selleck's character in Blue Bloods is very loosely based, in some instances, on Theodore Roosevelt's time as police commissioner. And you see the portrait of T.R. that's featured in the show in his office. And there are a few episodes where, again, things loosely, the, the, the plot is loosely based on things that happened during T.R.'s time as police commissioner. One of the things that T.R. did as police commissioner was he tried to enforce a law that prevented the selling of alcohol on Sundays. So we've talked about prohibition a good bit already in in his steps and kind of the progressive push towards regulating alcohol consumption. T.R. himself really didn't believe in prohibition. He wasn't an advocate of prohibition, but he believed that if the New York law said you can't sell alcohol on Sundays, well, then that had to be enforced. And the only reason it wasn't being enforced was that political machines were cooperating with the big saloons who could, pay the, who could pay off the police departments, basically not to enforce that law. So again, think about themes of political corruption and things like that. Roosevelt believed that was unethical, and he tried to close all the saloons in New York. Well, this was an impossible task, but he succeeded pretty well during the summer of 1895, but really alienated a lot of New Yorkers who didn't see anything wrong with drinking on Sundays, who resented this busybody commissioner up overturning the old ways. And by 1897, he had kind of made himself an annoyance to most of New York, and he was able to get out and do something else where he could be more effective. I know there's a lot of positions here, but he just held, held a lot of positions during his, his time as a public servant. The next thing he did was President William McKinley appointed him as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And he was only there for a short time before the Spanish-American War broke out. This is one of the more celebrated episodes of Roosevelt's career, where at the age of, I think, 39 it was, he resigned his position as Assistant Secretary of the Navy and volunteered to fight in the Spanish-American War and developed this Rough Riders Regiment that we'll look at more on Wednesday. So Wednesday we'll be looking at the Spanish-American War. You have a document from McKinley um, to read for that. So the context will be a little more clear then. But Roosevelt believed that the Spanish were mistreating Cubans in Cuba who wanted to be free from Spanish empire. He also believed the Spanish had blown up the USS Maine, the battleship in Havana Harbor. They probably hadn't, but he chose to believe that. And he believed that this was a righteous war that he personally needed to fight in. So he resigned his position. He cobbled together this Rough Riders regiment. He got himself appointed lieutenant colonel. Again, no, no real military experience, but he knew the right people. Okay? And there was a real colonel who was above him. And this Rough Riders regiment really did fight in battles. And it did, really did consist of kind of a cross-section of American life, of cowboys from the West, of some outlaws who were kind of on the run from the police in the West, of Harvard graduates and the best polo player in America. Roosevelt's idea was we will bring all these people together and they will effectively fight. They'll show what, um, how Americans can cooperate kind of across these class lines. And the most, most famous episode of this was the Battle of San Juan Hill in July of 1898, where Roosevelt and his Rough Riders charged up San Juan Hill, or really Kettle Hill, and captured the stronghold. Roosevelt shot and killed a Spanish soldier who was um, in his line of fire, and they helped take that position, which eventually helped them capture Cuba. The war itself was only four months long, and it's kind of this great moment for him um, as a military triumph. He comes back then when the war is over, and the Republicans are in need of a candidate for the governorship of New York, because the current governor is um, kind of mired in a scandal. And so Roosevelt is a war hero, is a natural choice. He hasn't always worked very well with the political bosses. He has an independent streak and a reform streak that they don't really appreciate. But he gets himself elected governor of New York in 1898 and serves for one two-year term. Then he and the bosses are really at loggerheads. They really can't get along very well, and they're looking for a way to get rid of him. So they have this idea that um, we should make Roosevelt vice president. Vice presidents have typically not been um, attracted to the stage, we'll say, in American life. They tend to be figureheads rather than kind of impressive, um, you know, substantive shapers of policy. And so they thought, we'll make Roosevelt McKinley's vice president He'll have to hide away in an office in Washington, D.C. He'll be out of our hair, and we won't hear from him again. 
Roosevelt was not really enthusiastic about taking on the job of the vice presidency. He didn't want to be a mere figurehead. He wanted to be um, someone who was actually shaping policy, but he believed that duty had called, and therefore he must go. Well, that worked fine until President William McKinley was assassinated in September of 1901, shot to death. Um, and therefore, all of a sudden, Theodore Roosevelt was now president of the United States, not exactly what the bosses had predicted or really wanted when they tried to get rid of him and make him vice president. So again, pause there for clarifications, questions. Yeah, Delati. FDR or Theodore Roosevelt that had a really long term? Yeah, so uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the, the fifth cousin, will be elected four times, the only president to be elected four times and served 12 years. Roosevelt, though Theodore Roosevelt, you're not entirely wrong to associate that with him because we'll talk in a few minutes about how he had almost two full terms and then would try for a third term un, un, unsuccessfully in 1912. Yeah, yeah Audrey. Do you think his multiple roles that he had um, made him more successful as a president? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I think it did. I think they did. Because as governor, he had some executive experience to actually be running a state or to be in charge. Um, I think that was an asset to him. Again, I think meeting different kinds of people in the West, people who he didn't grow up with, was an asset to him. Um, Understanding the political deals that had to be made, understanding the leadership of the Republican Party and its machine, I think, was an asset to him. And then his military experience. Um, The effectiveness of that can be debated. Uh, For example, when he was leading the charge up San Juan Hill, he, he forgot to give the order to his men to follow him. So he just charges up and then realizes nobody's behind him, yells at them for cowardice, and then, like, oh, I, didn't, you know, I need to give the order. So we can question how effective he was, but I think that experience of combat, um, the sense of how the military works, is probably an asset to him as well. Yeah, good question. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, well, then let's shift to think about some key events of Roosevelt's presidency. Roosevelt's presidency began with a rather rocky start when, in the fall of 1901, just really a few weeks after he had become president, he invited the African-American educator Booker T. Washington to have dinner with him in the White House. You know about Booker T. Washington. We read a document from Booker T. Washington on Friday, the leader of the Tuskegee Institute, and an advocate of cautious approaches for African-Americans to overcome Jim Crow. Washington was a Republican. Washington spoke for a segment of the black population in the United States, and Roosevelt valued him as a political consultant. But when word leaked out that the president had sat down as an equal, basically, to dinner with a black man in the White House, the White South exploded in rage. The headlines, some of them were really unprintable and things I won't quote to you. Um, But they were just outraged. It upset all the social order in the South, that Jim Crow order we talked about on Friday. It overturned all of that when a white president sat down on terms of at least rough equality with an African-American. Roosevelt defended his actions in the aftermath. He, I think, looked down his nose at the racism and prejudice that these white Southern newspaper editors and letters he was getting um, were showing. But he was also savvy enough to know that this was unpopular in parts of the country, and though he defended his actions and said he would do it as often as he pleased, he never did it again during his time as president. And by some accounts, he kind of went out of his way to avoid Booker T. Washington when they would be present at the same affairs and and so forth. So Roosevelt and race is a very interesting and tangled question. Um, We can get into that with questions if you'd like to uh, later on, but this is maybe one of his more noble achievements as president. The following year, then, Roosevelt got involved with issues of labor and capital that we've been discussing in class as well. In 1902, there was a coal strike, or a strike by coal workers in eastern Pennsylvania. And we talked a little bit about the conditions of labor. I showed you some pictures of the coal mines and so forth. You can imagine the conditions these men were laboring under. And we talked about strikes as kind of a last resort for that laboring population. A strike in the coal mines was particularly important and significant to the country because coal was the primary way that Americans heated their homes in 1902. 
Um, electric heating is not really in use yet, right? The light bulb's been invented only a few decades before. Coal is pretty much the way this happens. So if you don't have coal, it's going to be a very cold winter for most of the country, which would be very bad for the sitting president, right? Not to mention the humanitarian issues this would cause. So Roosevelt, as president, took a really unprecedented step of trying personally to get labor and capital to sit down together to work out their differences and to have some kind of compromise in this. And he's roughly able to do this. Um, he gets credit for it anyway. Um, some people were concerned that, he, that the president had no constitutional authority to mediate coal strikes, that he was stretching the powers of the presidency. And I find this very interesting, especially looking at his religious life. But his response to that was to tell a congressman that the Constitution was made for the people and not the people for the Constitution. The Constitution was made for the people and not the people for the Constitution. Some of you recognize the allusion to Christ's teaching about the Sabbath. That the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the extent to which Roosevelt was really just using rhetoric and really appropriating New Testament teachings, I guess we could discuss that. But I think there he's actually drawing on, at least uh, tangentially, one of Jesus' teachings that certainly shows his familiarity with the Bible. So that coal strike got resolved. Roosevelt got credit for it. The same year we had this interesting then uh, story, um, something all of you can relate to, the creation of uh, teddy bears. So Roosevelt was a big game hunter, and uh, he liked to hunt bear. This is his idea of his hobbies and the good times. He goes to Mississippi in 1902, and he just has the worst luck you can have trying to hunt these bears. They won't be found. He's down there. It's kind of an embarrassment because he's had reporters tagging along with him, and the party hasn't really gotten anything worth talking about. Well, finally, um, the dogs had found a bear. They had chased the bear. Um, they had kind of cornered it or whatever, and one of his hunting party had kind of hit the bear on the head with the butt of his rifle, but preserved it so that Roosevelt could get credit for the kill. And they called him, Mr. President, we, we found a bear. It's time for you to come in for the kill. And they had this poor thing like tied up to a tree. It's about the most scraggly looking bear you could find. It was already injured, and Roosevelt refused to shoot it. Now, this is not what I came here to do, to shoot a bear that's tied up to a tree just to get credit for a kill. And so he refused to do it. He said, just put this bear out of its misery. Somebody else did that. But word leaked back to the press and to the nation of what he had done of the sportsmanlike refusal to kill an injured animal. And the cartoonist Clifford Berryman drew this cartoon of Roosevelt, you know, refusing to shoot now this kind of cute little bear. Well, an enterprising New York businessman got the idea that we could capitalize on this image of bears by creating Teddy's bears, okay? So you have these plush stuffed animals, the teddy bears that you all know, um, that are produced en masse after this as a response to this episode here. So the teddy bears, the teddy is Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and the Theodore Roosevelt Association today, which is a group of admirers of TR, uh, they still um, give out teddy bears to sick kids in, in hospitals today. It's kind of a part of the legacy of this. Well, in 1904, I say he's re-elected in quotation marks. He wasn't really elected the first time, but he was elected in his own right. And that was important to him psychologically, I think, that he not just be brought into the presidency via assassination, but that the American people actually voted their approbation for him. And they, they did that in overwhelming fashion in 1904. Just a few highlights again as we look at his career. Um, Roosevelt won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in his second term for an, another mediation that he um, supervised, which was... Uh, uh, working out of treaty details between the Russians and Japanese who have been engaged in a war for the last year and a half. Roosevelt was concerned about the balance of power in East Asia. He respected the Japanese as a rising power in the world, uh, but he didn't want to destabilize things too much, and so uh, he let it be known to both parties that he would be willing to supervise a meeting between them to bring peace. And he wasn't really personally at that peace conference too much when it happened in Portsmouth, New Hampshire in 1905. But it was his direction that brought these two powers together. They worked out a treaty, and again, kind of like the coal strike, he got credit for ending this major conflict in the world. 
Some policy positions he took, again, related to things we have talked about or will talk about in this class. I mentioned that he was not really a proponent of prohibition. I think the Republican Party and probably himself believed that it was unconstitutional and um, un-American to interfere in people's rights to, to drink. So he was not a person who abstained from alcohol himself, although he was always a moderate drinker. And eventually, he kind of changed his mind, like a lot of people did, on women's suffrage later on in his career. I would say he was a tepid supporter, a lukewarm supporter of women's suffrage. He wasn't a passionate advocate for it. Um, but he came to feel, feel that if that's what the American people wanted, then that was fine, that women um, had the right to vote. Um, but that also didn't change his rather traditional views of women's roles as primarily as wives and mothers. Then his work on conservation is worth talking about a little bit. Uh, we mentioned this at the very beginning, that during his presidency, Roosevelt um, signed a piece of legislation called the Antiquities Act in 1906. You know, presidents in our system aren't dictators. They have to work with Congress, right? So the Antiquities Act was passed, but he interpreted that act loosely to give himself the authority to set aside bird reservations, national parks, sanctuaries of various kinds. And he didn't create the national park system that had already been in place, but he expanded it by creating five new national parks during his time as president. And this is one of those legacies um, that a lot of people appreciate about Roosevelt, even if they don't agree with his policies, even if they disagree about other aspects of him. Most people respect his work on conservation. And indeed, there is now Theodore Roosevelt National Park that honors his work there. We can pause for clarifications, questions about Roosevelt and his presidency. Yeah, Audrey. Um, we haven't really talked about this, but what are his opinions on world affairs besides, obviously, the mediating that he did? Yeah, good question. So his opinions on world affairs beyond the um, Russo-Japanese War. Well, on Friday, we'll spend some time looking at the aftermath of the Spanish-American War, which is the time when America began to gain a global empire and acquired the Philippines. It acquired Guam and Puerto Rico and exercised indirect influence in Cuba. Roosevelt was a full-throated imperialist. He was enthusiastic about as much empire as Americans could gain. And he believed that some groups like the Filipinos, that they were not competent for self-government, that they needed to be tutored by the United States to eventually, maybe decades, maybe centuries later, be able to have their own independence in their own form of democracy. This is one of Roosevelt's views that we tend to find less tasteful today, right, and more objectionable. And we'll spend more time with that on Wednesday and Friday. Um, but yes, he was definitely an advocate of uh, empire, the extension of American influence as far as possible. Yeah, good question. Other questions? We'll look at his life a little bit after the presidency, with which, if anything, was maybe even more exciting than his time as president. So many presidents in the United States, after they leave office, they sort of fade into obscurity. Um, we could think of some recent examples of this. You know, we don't see former President Bush or Obama or Trump kind of campaigning for new offices or you know things like that. Um, that was not the tack that. President Theodore Roosevelt took after he stopped being president. In 1908, he was technically eligible to run for a essentially third term. Number one, there was no constitutional prohibition against that at this point in American history. It was only the precedent that George Washington had set of two terms that would have prevented him from running. And secondly, he hadn't even really had a full first term because he had shared it with McKinley. Nevertheless, Roosevelt believed in 1908 it was not wise for him to run for a third term that it would essentially be violating. The precedent, the wise precedent that George Washington has set of only two terms for any one person. And so he voluntarily chose not to run in 1908. Instead, he supported um, his friend and cabinet member, William Howard Taft, as the Republican nominee, and Taft won in 1908. Roosevelt then decided to leave the country for a year and a half, maybe to give Taft some breathing room and also to fulfill, I think, a lifelong ambition to hunt big game in Africa. So he and his son Kermit and a large party 
go on safari in Africa from 1909 to 1910. They start in British East Africa, and they work their way in the interior a little bit, and eventually north before they emerge in Cairo. And Roosevelt and his party um, shot and killed over 500 specimens in this um, big game expedition that they did. Yes, that is quite a few. Um, Roosevelt's justification for this was that this was not hunting just for sport, that they ate some of the animals that they killed, And the vast majority of these skins then were preserved and sent back to museums in the United States to be studied for scientific purposes. So it wasn't just mindless slaughter for him. It had a civic purpose. It had a scientific purpose. Um, But this is part of his enthusiasm for empire also. The British are in control of East Africa. They give him permission to go and, you know, shoot up the countryside, but... You know, the local Kenyans don't give them any permission, right? They're enlisted as porters and as assistants and so forth. But this is part of the, um, the imperial world that Roosevelt believed in and participated in. So he does that for fun um, and really has a, a kind of grand time with this. But he comes back to the United States in 1910 and is dismayed by reports about what President Taft is doing. He hears that President Taft is not as strong on conservation as Roosevelt had been. And then, in fact, he had fired Roosevelt's friend, Chief Forrester, a man named Gifford Pinchot, P-I-N-C-H-O-T. He's also concerned that Taft doesn't have the kind of energy and drive that Roosevelt himself had brought to the presidency, and that Taft um, is more content to let Congress do some things, and he doesn't have the kind of um, energy that Roosevelt would have liked. Truth be told, Roosevelt's own policies had begun to drift leftward in these years as well. During the course of his presidency, and especially by the early 19-teens, he had gotten more radical and more progressive in his views. He decided in 1912 to take just about the unprecedented step of challenging Taft for the Republican nomination. This happens once in a while in American politics, but not very often. Okay, so... This would, you know, this would be in 2024 if another Democrat would challenge President Biden for the nomination. This is usually seen as disloyal to the party. It's usually seen as unwise, as giving a hand to the other party. But Roosevelt believed, or at least told himself he believed, that Taft was doing such a poor job that it was time for Roosevelt to return to the White House. He challenges, Roosevelt, or he challenges Taft for the nomination in 1912, loses, doesn't get it. He alleges fraud at the convention. The convention had not treated his delegates fairly. That's a very arcane issue that we won't try to solve right now. I don't know there's a whole lot of validity to it, but that's what he told himself. And he broke precedent further by creating a new party, that he was still going to run for president even without the Republican label. This party was the Progressive Party, or called the Bull Moose Party, for Roosevelt's statement that he felt strong as a bull moose. So again, progressivism, the Progressive Party, these are things we'll come back to next week. Um, Roosevelt runs as a third-party candidate in 1912. He gains some support. He'll eventually win, oh, I think about seven states or so in the Electoral College. But his campaign was cut rather short in October by one of Roosevelt's closest brushes with death. So in October 1912, he's in the city of Milwaukee. He's there to give a speech. He gets out of the car. And as he's getting out of a car, an assassin shoots him at point-blank range. A bullet enters into his body. He tastes his mouth a little bit to see if he's coughing up blood. He's not. He concludes that his lungs have not been punctured and that he can probably go ahead and give his speech anyway. So he goes into the auditorium in Milwaukee. He addresses the crowd. He says, I don't know if all of you have just realized I've been shot. And people kind of have not heard this. They don't really believe him. So he opens his sport coat to reveal the increasing blob of blood on his chest. And he seems to actually, at that moment, realize maybe the full extent of his injuries kind of shocks him a little bit. And he also seems to realize, or should realize, that the only thing that had really prevented that bullet from going in further was that his speech had been folded many times and put in his pocket over his heart. And the speech had seemed to slow down the bullet. So he said, I can't give a very long speech today, and the doctors are trying to get him off the stage and take him to the hospital. And he says, if 
If they don't behave themselves, they can't look at me at all, okay? But he goes and gives a speech. He goes about 45 minutes and, you know, seems to be kind of wobbly a little bit and says, well, I'll go just, just a little bit longer. He goes another half an hour or so, throwing the pages with the bullet marks down on the floor, and it kind of turns into this great moment of Roosevelt's idea of persistence and this idea of kind of the strenuous life and some of that bodybuilding and things we had talked about. And, you know, he played it off that my friends from the West, back in the cowboy days and so forth, when they heard that I gave this speech, they weren't surprised at all. They just thought that's what you would do in those kind of circumstances. So eventually he goes to the hospital. Eventually he gets x-rayed. And he's kind of put on bed rest for a while. And he's not really able to campaign anymore. Whether this injury really changed the outcome of the election is doubtful. I don't think there was really a path for him to win the Electoral College in any kind of sense. But it really kind of put the kibosh on any efforts that he was really going to have to win at all. And he comes in actually second. Poor Taft comes in third. He only, he only wins a few states. Well, the Democrat Woodrow Wilson is elected instead. Questions on any of that? And this is, yeah, Delana. I have a question. Yep. It's not related to this. It's like going a little back. But okay. is, because I know about like gag law and all that kind of stuff, but I'm not too sure about like dates and stuff. <coughs> is Roosevelt like a part of the gag law or a part of the problem, per se? Explain to the class what you mean by... So okay. the gag law is um, a law that was put on Puerto Rico where they couldn't like use their uh, flags or um, like sing any patriotic songs mm-hmm. or anything as a way almost to assimilate them um, to the United States. So That's a good question. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. I don't know if he had any role in that or not. Um, when we talk about empire, there's the most resistance to that comes from the Philippines by far. Um, And so Puerto Rico gets a lot less attention in most of the historical writing, so I don't know the answer to that, but that's that's worth investigating further. Yeah. Yeah, Caden. Is uh, is Teddy Roosevelt going to be president uh, more of a third party or a third party to win the states in an election? Has that ever been done? Um, Yeah, I think it has been done, but he's one of the more successful third party candidates. So third parties typically push issues into the limelight that maybe haven't been there before. They shift the political conversation sometimes, but it's rare for them to actually win a lot of states. So, yeah, he's not the only candidate to win any states in Electoral College, but he's one of the most successful third parties. Andy and then Chloe, yeah. Um, I remember you mentioning that um, his views on Americans should yeah. drastically elaborate on, like, because he went west and he must have right. interaction. Yeah, it's a great, great question about Roosevelt and Native Americans, especially his time in the West. In his younger days, um, he did make statements like, um, I wouldn't say the only good Indian is a dead Indian, but that's true, nine out of ten cases, and I wouldn't want to look too closely into the case of the tenth. Okay, so he did have those very kind of disturbing statements. By the 19-teens, by the time we're about to get into, he actually takes a trip to um, Navajo reservations, and... I think Pueblo Reservations, too. There's, there's a, a, another group he goes to. And he actually is invited in to see some of their ceremonies. He meets with some of the chiefs. And he still has, a, what we would say, a condescending, dismissive view. But he does have a sense that their cultures are interesting and worth preserving. Um, so it may not be where we'd like him to be, but I think he does shift and evolve on those issues in some cases over the decades. Yeah, good question. Yeah, Chloe? In, like government in high school about how like third parties were normally intended to split a party so was his thought to like was he hoping that he would win or was he just hoping that by splitting the party Taft would lose um I think he really hoped to win um he hated Woodrow Wilson we'll come to hate him more <laughs> as time went on he took no joy in a Wilson victory but I think he was also angry at the Republican leadership for having denied him what he thought of as his delegates to the convention, he should have been their nominee. So there wasn't a lot of love lost between them two, between those, those two either. I think he hoped to win, um, and he will try to get back into the good graces of the Republicans in the last few years of his life without a whole lot of success, because um, they're pretty angry with him for what he did in 1912. But some people think he might have been the Republicans' nominee in 1920 had he lived that far. Yeah, good question. Well, a few things here to wrap up then. After his time with the, as a bull moose candidate in 1912, he leaves once again. And this seems to be one of his ways of dealing with disappointment. 
or loss of power to go to the West, to go to Africa, to go to South America. So he goes to Brazil in 1913 and 1914. It's not his initial plan to explore an unknown river, (laughs) but it becomes the plan when he's down there. A Brazilian official kind of suggests to him offhand that we have this river called the River of Doubt, and no one except the locals really knows where it goes. It's not really on the map. Why don't you explore that? And he kind of pivots at the last moment from giving a speaking tour to doing an exploration trip, for which he, truth be told, is very ill-prepared. But he and his men... Um, spend several months on this unknown river. Uh, It's a horrible ordeal for them. Um, One, two, three members of their party are lost, killed by various motives and reasons. He gets malaria. He loses 55 pounds. But they do make it to their end point. They do put this river on the map in a way that hadn't been before. So Candace Millard's book, The River of Doubt, Theodore Roosevelt's Darkest Journey, is a great read that kind of tells you that story. If you take the Roosevelt's class with me in J-Term, we'll, we'll read that and discuss that more. But again, kind of, he said later on, this is my last chance to be a boy, to do something adventurous, okay, even though he was in his 50s and not really in the greatest shape. Last thing that maybe we'd say is World War I, and that's something we'll talk about um, about a week and a half as we kind of wrap up our time with the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. Like World War II, the United States was uninvolved in World War I from the moment that it broke out. It would be about two and a half years before the nation would really get involved. Roosevelt had very strong opinions about World War I. He believed the United States needed to intervene on the side of the British and the French, and he tried to resurrect the Rough Riders. He tried to start a new division that was going to go to Europe and fight in the same way the Rough Riders had gone to Cuba. Well, again, now he's in his 50s. He's already gone through these ordeals. This has not been a good idea. Wilson was not anxious to do him any favors. He shot down the Rough Riders idea pretty quickly. But Roosevelt sent all four of his sons to fight in his place, one of whom um, was shot and killed in an aerial duel in one of these early days of aerial warfare in World War I. And then only about six months after that, a few months after the armistice was signed in November 1918, Roosevelt died January 6, 1919, at the age of 60. So let me hit our last slide and then take any final questions that you might have here. Well, here's a picture of the River of Doubt and his expedition. So I hope you've seen, as we've looked at this, some retrospective looks at our previous lectures and readings as Roosevelt's life embodied many of these themes of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. Labor and capital, race, the West and Native Americans, progressive reforms, and the things that we'll look at here in the coming days, the Spanish-American War and Empire, political developments, and World War I. Roosevelt was and is an extraordinarily popular figure. He's one of the four presidents to be on Mount Rushmore, for example, okay? along with Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln. He's routinely ranked highly by presidential historians and by the general public. Again, the fact that some of you knew some things about TR before we even started today is evidence of the way that um, his popularity continues to shine, even if it's only in the night of the museum or something like that. But Roosevelt also continues to be controversial in some respects, um, in no area so much as his advocacy of empire. The National Museum of American History in New York City, within the past few weeks, has removed a statue of him that was sat out there for a long time, of him on horseback, flanked by an African and a Native American, uh, which was interpreted to be, and probably correctly, as an endorsement of Roosevelt's imperial image. And the museum felt that that was so controversial and not in keeping with their commitments to equality that they needed to move it somewhere else. It's now in, um, or it's on its way to South Dakota, where they're building a presidential, I'm sorry, North Dakota, where they're building a presidential museum and library for Roosevelt, and where that statue can be studied in context. So he has his popularity, but especially in terms of race, he's very conflicted and very difficult to analyze today. Most people find something they like about T.R., the personality, and you got a sense of that if you took an outline, there's a quote from Richard Washburn Child that you go to the Roosevelt, or you go to the White House, you meet with Roosevelt, you shake hands with him, and then you go home to bring the personality out of your clothes, right? That he's just kind of this magnetic figure. Or his work on conservation, or his endorsement of women's suffrage, something like that. But then most people also find something that they dislike about TR, his views on race, his ego, which was not very small, we'll put it that way, okay? That grasping for power, And there's a lot of cautions to be said, too. 
So just conclude that, like him or hate him, right, he was an extraordinary human being who helped shape the modern United States, the modern presidency. He uh, took the presidency from being subservient to Congress, and he, along with Wilson, made it above Congress. Now, that might be good, that might be bad, depending on your views, but it definitely happened, and he's one of the people who's responsible for that and for helping shape the nation the way it is. Thoughts, final thoughts, questions? We've got a few seconds left. Yeah, Zoe. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, what was his family life like and like his relationships with his children and yeah, his wife? Yeah, great question. Um, so mostly positive relationships with his children. His oldest daughter, Alice, who was born to the first Alice, um, as an infant, she lived to like 1979. Okay, she lived into her 90s. She was the most cantankerous <laughs> of the children, um, but she, she felt that she never got her father's full attention, and that's a pretty common thing when you have presidents and leaders that some of their kids feel like they kind of get shunted away. Alice felt that the worst, partly because Roosevelt never spoke a word to her about her mom because it was too painful for him, but we have no record ever of Roosevelt ever talking about the first Alice after 1884. So that maybe wasn't the best relationship Um, His other kids really admired him, seemed to idolize him. Um, They went on to various kinds of careers, Ted, um, into politics in some ways. Um, Kermit uh, was troubled and then committed suicide in the 1940s. Um, Quentin died in World War I, but um, mostly they were supportive of him, and his wife was protective of him. Um, Burned some of their correspondence. (sighs) Hate that because you'd like to see what was, but she was just private that... Our feelings and our family life are not for us to read, you know, 100 years later. Yeah, one more. Why are you guys so young? Yeah, so he died, in, yeah, so 60 years old. Impossible to know. Um, some historians or some doctors kind of did some, like, retrospective investigations in 2010. Something to do with heart problems, um, but it's hard to know because he suffered from a lot of ailments from war injuries from, or I should say at least kind of like malaria he got in Cuba, then he got it again in South America. Heart issues, he had abscesses on various parts of his body late in life. Um, So hard to pin down exactly, but probably a heart issue if you want to be more romantic about it. He died of a broken heart when his youngest son, Quentin, died in World War I, so may have had something to do with it. All right, well, good work today. Thanks for your participation dialogue. We'll be back in here on Wednesday to look at the Spanish-American War in more detail. Have a good rest of your Monday. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out our podcast, First Ladies, in their own words, using material from C-SPAN's award-winning biography series, First Ladies, and source material from C-SPAN's video library. You'll listen to first spouses addressing issues important to them and the country. The program includes eight modern First Ladies, from Lady Bird Johnson to Melania Trump. First Ladies, in their own words, wherever you get your podcasts.